This video is brought to you by Raycon. Hello, hello, I'm still here living my life, doing what I'm doing and jamming out to music pretty much. Uh, uh, jamming out to music pretty much all the time thanks to my Raycon Everyday Earbuds. I've tried multiple types of earbuds, but my Raycons easily have the most comfortable fit and the sleekest design in my book, especially thanks to the assortment of different sized silicone tips they came with. I forget they're in all the time and I can run around and shake all over and they won't fall out. The sound quality is great. Hello? Is someone here? Huh, uh, uh, the, the sound quality is great. They pack a lot of bass into one small package. I also love how I can take calls at the touch of a button. And best of all, they last up to eight hours on a charge and up to 32 hours using the charging case. Heck, I probably get even longer than that because of how often I wear only one earbud while I'm with people. I feel like I barely ever have to charge them. Raycons are half the price of other premium wireless earbuds and they've got over 48,000 five-star reviews. If you want to try them out for yourself, hit the link down in the description or head to buyraycon.com slash Arlo to get 15% off your order. Ah! Yeah, a half decade. A half decade. One half of one unit of time equal to 10 years on the Gregorian calendar. It seems like only yesterday that we were wondering what the NX even was, but it has truly been five whole years since the launch of what we would come to know as the Switch. We don't know if this puts us closer to the end of a seven year console cycle or somewhere in the middle of an unusually long 10 year cycle. But we do know that a significant amount of the Switch's life has passed us by. And in that time, countless dreams have come true. Dormant series have been given new life. Already popular series have been reimagined. And Nintendo, along with a wealth of third party and indie developers and publishers have created a library for the record books. Obviously, we've still got a ways to go with the Switch, but I'd like to do something special to celebrate this milestone. Other years, I've simply given an update on my experiences and feelings regarding the Switch, but this time, I'm going to focus on the games themselves. After a half decade, what are the games I've enjoyed most? And for a special treat, because you ate all your broccoli, I've got two top tens breaking down my favorites. As usual, keep in mind that I don't get to play every game out there, and for all I know, there are plenty of titles that would have made the list if I'd played them. This is all based on my experiences with the Switch thus far. Well, we got a lot to cover, so what do you say we jump on in? First up are the third-party and indie multiplats non-Nintendo games that are available on plenty of systems, but that I personally have exclusively played on my Switch. Let's get going. Ubisoft obviously had very high hopes for Starlink Battle for Atlas. This was their take on the Toys to Life concept, and between the marketing, the Star Fox tie-in, and the very kid-friendly vibe, it's easy to see that this wasn't just a game they wanted to sell, this was a brand they wanted to launch. Unfortunately, by the time it released, Toys to Life had run its natural course, and actually many players were put off by the idea of needing to buy actual toys in order to play the game. Combine that with the repetitive gameplay and the usual Ubisoft fluff, and you've got an IP that was, sadly, dead on arrival. This guy right here, though? I love it! Starlink is very silly, totally filled with repetitive fluff, and way too scared of breaking away from its generic style to do anything really interesting with the story, but darn it, I just think it's fun. The concept of customizing a little toy ship and having that translate to the game really appeals to the kid in me even if it is a little cumbersome. The gameplay is fun enough to keep me exploring and fighting and scanning for hours on end, and seamlessly flying up into space, through the solar system, then down onto another planet is still very novel to me. 
And the cherry on top. On Switch, I can play as Fox McCloud and pretend I'm playing an open world Star Fox game. Honestly, if they had ditched the toys and simply worked with Nintendo to make this an open world Star Fox game, I think it would have been much more successful. We're definitely never going to see another Starlink game in the future, but I'm happy we got this one. And I won't be getting rid of my big old box of ship parts anytime soon. 2D platformers with linear structures and very little in the way of progression systems are not usually for me. It takes a very special platformer to capture my heart, and Celeste is one of those platformers. The controls are so fluid and responsive, making every victory feel earned and every loss feel fair. The level design is simply impeccable, with a wealth of clever mechanics, all explored to their fullest with perfect pacing. The difficulty is high, but generous checkpoints and instant respawns keep frustration to a minimum and compel me to keep trying. The music and visuals are superb, the characters and story deliver a touching message about struggling with inner demons and overcoming huge odds. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Celeste is an indie masterpiece, and just about as close to a perfect game as you're likely to find. Speaking of indie masterpieces, have you heard of Undertale? On the surface, the game is an adventure inspired by Earthbound and other old-school RPGs, but its unique elements elevate it far above a simple love letter. The characters shine like diamonds, and every bit of writing, from dialogue to simple narration, is dripping with charm and laugh-out-loud humor. The way you evade attacks is incredibly clever and makes enemies all fun to fight in their own unique ways. Even more clever is the morality system where you can either kill an enemy or find a way to get away peacefully because it's like playing two different games depending on what you choose. Then the story and how it changes depending on your decisions, it's just incredible. Throw in one banger of a soundtrack and you've got yourself one of the most delightfully weird and joyously original games I've ever played. And the fact that it was made by such a small team, yet still managed to be more successful than some AAA games made by industry giants with massive teams, that makes me happy. Legend has it, two folks at Villa Gorilla were walking one day when they accidentally collided. One exclaimed, you got pinball in my Metroidvania. The other exclaimed, you got Metroidvania in my pinball. And the rest is history. Yoku's Island Express, a game that bravely pairs two <laughs> very different genres, was my surprise game of the year in 2018. It mixes pinball with Metroidvania-style exploration and progression almost flawlessly. The world is incredibly fun to traverse, offering a great mix of wider areas, tightly designed puzzle platforming challenges, and more traditional pinball boards. The visuals are absolutely stunning. It's this colorful painterly style with just enough 3D depth to bring it to life and really make it all pop. It's got a lot of fun characters and creatures to meet and some surreal elements that really captivate me. The game is just the right length, not too long, not too short, and dense enough that most of my time feels meaningful. Yoku's Island Express is just a delightful game and one that more people need to try out, okay? In an increasingly stressful and confusing world, games like A Short Hike are akin to therapy for me. It's got this soft, gentle vibe that never lets up. The visuals are simple, yet still incredibly effective, evoking the joy of spending time in a peaceful, natural environment. All the little animal characters are absolutely adorable and always tend to have something funny or interesting to say. And in an industry where emotional gut punches are now the norm, it's refreshing to play a game that touches on complex emotions while still delivering an overall lighthearted and uplifting story. A short hike would work well enough as a purely story-driven experience, but the beauty here is that everything is tied to your exploration. Flying and climbing mechanics make traversal very fun, and there's a lot of stuff to find. You collect golden feathers that increase how high you can fly and climb, so there's even a progression system in place to make everything feel that much more rewarding. It's a short game, but it's probably as long as it needs to be. And it's so enjoyable to explore that I always tend to stick around long after I've reached the top of the mountain. It was made by one person in a very short amount of time, once again proving that the right person with the right idea can create something extraordinary. 
I love Resident Evil a whole lot. The gameplay and all the weirdo monsters and everything, it just clicks with me. Resident Evil Revelations 2 has a campaign that's pretty good, solid, lots of fun boss fights and stuff, a fun story for sure, but the campaign isn't what makes this one of my very favorite Switch games. No, it's that thing I'm always talking about whenever Resident Evil comes up, raid mode. The fun of modern Resident Evil gameplay, but with a wacky arcadey spin, a huge number of medals to earn across an also huge array of levels, beloved Resident Evil characters to unlock and upgrade, endless weapons to find and customize, and both local and online co-op. Yeah, yeah, you can bet I've spent a fair amount of time with this game. It's Resident Evil, except you can play it for like a hundred hours easy. Nothing more to say, except give us a Raid Mode 3 or a full Raid Mode game, Capcom, do it! Pinball plus Metroidvania might have been an unexpected combo, but it's been obvious for a while now that Souls-like plus Metroidvania is a match made in heaven. Blasphemous mixes brutal strategic combat with 2D platforming and ability-based progression, and the end result is nothing short of a miracle. It's a very difficult game, but as with Celeste, its large number of checkpoints, particularly those before bosses, allow me to learn by failing without feeling like I'm wasting my time. The world is positively gigantic, and you just never know how it's going to spread out before you. It's also stuffed to the gills with cool items and power-ups to find, fueling exploration and giving me a constant sense that I'm getting stronger. It features the Dark Souls style of grotesque monsters in a medieval fantasy setting, but with a few twists that make it feel unique. The enemy designs are grimly delightful, and the pixel art on display is simply stunning. Blasphemous is one of my very favorite games on Switch, and if you like Souls-likes or Metroidvanias, you owe it to yourself to try it out. Paper Mario, but with bugs. This descriptor isn't always fair because Bug Fables manages to tell its own unique story in its own world with its own lore. But on the other hand, it's not trying to hide its influences. This is a game that is very clearly meant to evoke the style of the first two Paper Mario titles. Those games are so beloved that it's a risky angle, but I can say with confidence that the risk paid off. In the same way that Thousand Year Door improved upon the original Paper Mario, Bug Fables improves upon the formula further. The combat adds new elements and strategic depth to the experience, and ups the difficulty just enough to make it feel more rewarding. Instead of a main character fighting with a partner, here we've got three main characters all working together, and this opens up a ton of potential. There are loads of interesting medals to find, this game's equivalent of Paper Mario's badges, so players can experiment and find a playstyle that works for them. Then the story is fun, the writing is great, and the three characters share an incredible chemistry. It's a thoroughly enjoyable game from start to finish, and as close to a Paper Mario 3 as I could hope for. Hashtag play bug fables. I didn't get Dark Souls at first. The combat seemed sluggish, the controls unresponsive, the bosses unfairly hard, but something kept calling me back and eventually it all clicked. And once that click happened, I had an adventure that was equal parts thrilling and infuriating and terrifying and magical. Sure, the game is hard, but I learned the value in such difficulty. I learned that a fight may feel impossible, but every foe has a weakness. I was forced to pay close attention to everything and to constantly hone my skill. And best of all, I got to experience the rapturous euphoria of felling an enemy after many, many attempts. One thing that always kept me going was the world. It's this grim, unsettling place filled with the most bizarre creatures. It's so intricately woven together and largely seamless, with very few loading zones. The first time through, I was constantly surprised and amazed by the environment. Despite my eventual getting good, I do think the game has got some problems. It was much too difficult to figure out without reading a lot of guides. Boss runbacks can die forever. And I will go to my grave cheesing the Capra Demon with firebombs. But holy cow, if Dark Souls ain't something special. I get it. I get it. Stardew Valley is the best game. Alright? It's the best 
game. It's so much the best game that the idea of trying to write a little summary here is kind of overwhelming. I mean, what do I say? It's a farming game, which is already fun, but then there are like a million other things to do and it's all just so peaceful and magical. The music, oh, the music. And you can go in the caves and there's a, and there's a community center and, nah. I can't, I can't sum it up here. I'm sorry, Stardew Valley. That's, that's the thing. There you go. That's it for the multiplats. So now we come to the juiciest fruit of all. The games that the Switch will be remembered for. The exclusives. Another disclaimer, some of these games are on PC as well, but they're at least console exclusives. So, eh, I'm counting them. And one game is technically on Wii U. I, I, I think you probably already know what I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's my list and I'm doing what I want. So here we go. These are my top 10 Switch exclusives after one half of a decade. That's my, that's my new thing. Here we go, it's my new catchphrase. Three Houses was the first Fire Emblem game I played and what a place to start. I love a good strategy game and the gameplay here does not disappoint. What surprised me going in, however, was how much there is to do in order to support that gameplay. The Academy presents a near endless series of mini games to play and items to hunt down and little quests to go on, and it all feeds into your characters. Everything you do works to make your unit stronger. And the whole school aspect allows you to spec them however you like, so you can really make your team your own. What also surprised me was the story and characters. The plot's got some fun twists and turns with moral quandaries aplenty. The characters are all fully voiced and the amount of dialogue here is absurd. Every single character in the game can develop a relationship with every other character, each pairing giving you a series of completely unique conversations. Not only does this help me connect with the characters, but it's also just plain entertaining. Even without the game part of Three Houses, the writing and voice acting are good enough that a huge amount of the fun is just the, the talking. Now, it's worth noting, the game looks awful. The characters themselves look good, but the environments, especially in battle, are positively dreadful. But it doesn't matter, because the rest of the game is just that good. Take the Monster Hunter universe, make the combat turn-based, and create a huge world to explore? That's a recipe for success right there. Monster Hunter Stories 2 is the perfect companion piece to Monster Hunter because it so flawlessly adapts the series formula into this new style and offers so much that you just can't get with the mainline games. The combat is wonderful. It's fast, it's strategic, it's fun to watch, and it's unlike anything I've played before. Raiding monster dens for eggs is incredibly fun, and the game's got this super deep breeding system. It's the kind of game where you can spend ages just exploring and improving your monsters if you want. I've put a ton of hours in, and I would put many, many more if I had the time. Overall, just a super good game, and one of the many on Switch that have really hooked me. I think you'll soon find that games with tons and tons of content that hook me and burn hundreds of hours of my life are rather common on this list. The original Hyrule Warriors was fun, but Age of Calamity improves upon the idea drastically. Sure, you lose the fanfic grab bag wackiness, but you gain a much more grounded and coherent story. Even with its more controversial elements, the story is tons of fun with many jaw-dropping moments. The scope is unlike anything Zelda has ever achieved before, and it fills a lot of the gaps left in Breath of the Wild quite well. The gameplay is tight with tons of characters to choose from, many of which came as huge surprises. Sure, it's pretty repetitive like any Warriors game, but the moment to moment action is so much fun and there's so much to do both on and off the battlefield that it doesn't matter. Loads of challenges to overcome, items to collect, fighters to upgrade, an entire kingdom to build up. It's the classic, just one more mission kind of game. And if somewhere down the line, Nintendo decides it would make sense to produce yet another Hyrule Warriors, perhaps as a companion piece to some future Zelda title, that will be a-okay with me. Finally, a short game. Bowser's Fury isn't even its own game, technically, because you can only find it stapled onto the Super Mario 3D World Switch port, but I'm counting it as its own game because it, it basically is. 
Bowser's Fury doesn't only get points because it takes ideas from 3D World and builds a more sandbox experience out of them, but also because it does so many interesting new things. One giant seamless open space to play in with a super speedy mount for easier travel, areas that refresh with new challenges again and again, an ongoing conflict with a colossal Bowser set to an actual real-time clock, and while it's disappointing that the game doesn't last too long, I'm fascinated by the idea of these kinds of smaller Mario experiences. And actually, there's something really refreshing about being able to 100% a game in a couple sittings. Everything about Bowser's Fury is refreshing. It's this airy, fluid, playful romp that I really can play again and again, and it never gets old. Sandbox Mario forever! Woo! And we're back to the life-stealing games. Monster Hunter Rise is another game that took some time to click with me, and it also clicked very hard. Once I got to grips with the controls, I found an exceptionally deep and refined combat system. It just gives and gives the more you put into it, and there are so many weapons to choose from that completely change how you play the game. The titular monsters are so exquisitely designed and animated that fighting them never gets old. And the loop of fighting stuff, then using your spoils to craft better gear to fight even harder stuff and get better spoils is both endlessly rewarding and hopelessly addictive. The hours melt away when playing this game, especially if you're hunting with your buddies. Speaking of which, the online performance is terrific. And actually, the whole game looks weirdly amazing and runs weirdly well for a Switch game. It's a beautiful, finely tuned, hyper enjoyable experience. And easily some of the most fun I've had with my Switch. Pokemon Legends Arceus was a heck of a surprise. After the previous Pokemon games on Switch, it felt like the series was permanently stuck in a limbo of mediocrity, and people like me were doomed to forever scream about it into the void. But just like that, Arceus dropped me into a world where everything was different. Being able to manually throw Pokeballs is a game changer. The new catching system is so different, yet it feels like a perfectly natural part of the formula. Wandering around and catching Pokemon in their natural habitats fulfills a decades-old dream of mine. Having to protect your character and jump out of the way of attacks lends a sense of immersion unlike any previous Pokemon experience. And it's clear that this was when Game Freak decided to finally have their Breath of the Wild moment, where they rethought and reworked loads of systems that have remained largely unchanged for ages. There's just so much about the game to love, and even though the world feels a little basic at times, I still managed to put close to 100 hours into it. That's just how much potential this new formula has. We don't know how much of Arceus will carry over into the next mainline games yet, but I can easily say that for the first time in many years, I'm excited about the direction the series is going. Luigi's Mansion 3 is a rare game. The visual style and animation are unusually good. There are more intricate, charming little details and gags packed into the runtime than I could possibly count. The visuals push the Switch to its absolute limit, far beyond what I imagined it was capable of. And the gameplay is so uniquely Nintendo. There really isn't anything out there quite like Luigi's Mansion. And I'm sure Nintendo would love to hear me say this because one of their philosophies is to treat games less like games and more like toys, but honestly, the game is like a big puzzly toy box. It zeroes in on the simple joy of interacting with stuff, searching for treasure and clues, generally playing around. The moment to moment is just so polished with an unusual amount of attention given to how everything feels. The game does have some problems. The new slam mechanic is a bit overpowered. There isn't enough to do with the money I collect and the hotel could have used a few more floors, but I still treasure this game because of how unbelievably unique it is. Like I said, no one else is making games quite like this, and that puts it high on my list. A series goes defunct for close to two decades. It feels like it's never coming back. Then it does, and the new game is everything you could have wanted and more. When does that happen? Can that happen? Well, it happened here at least. Metroid Dread dropped into an ocean of really excellent Metroidvanias, and it did exactly what it needed to to float to the top. 
It's got all the trappings of a good Metroidvania, but manages to achieve what most titles can't thanks to its Nintendo-sized budget. Gameplay so polished and smooth that picking up the controller is like slipping into your favorite sweater. Super slick visuals with flashy, action-packed cutscenes. And of course, there's the biggest advantage it's got over the competition. It's got Samus! It's a Metroid game! It's not absolutely perfect. It would be nice if the different areas connected to each other a little more naturally. And while I enjoy the Emmy encounters, I can see how a lot of players are put off by them. And sure, there are bigger, longer Metroidvanias out there, but Dread is still an exquisite experience. I already love the older Metroid games, but now we've got one that feels better than ever, looks better than ever, and in my opinion, has the best combat and bosses in the entire series. You done good, Mercury Steam. Now do it again, please. I loved Super Mario 64 as a kid and Sunshine as a teen, but the more linear Marios that came later didn't click with me nearly as much, and I've just never been that into 2D Mario. For this reason, I've spent much of my life not really feeling like a Mario fan per se. That's why it feels a little weird to be here, putting Mario higher on this list than even Luigi's Mansion or Pokemon. But no matter how much I ponder on it, I come away with the same conclusion. Super Mario Odyssey really is one of my absolute favorite games on Switch, and actually one of my favorites of the last decade or so. It's the sandbox Marios from my youth, but all grown up. A polished modern visual style covering so many different ideas and themes. Hands down, the best feeling controls in the series. A massive wealth of different mechanics to play with. Huge levels to explore. More collectibles than ever. A lack of challenges that make me want to tear my hair out. <laughs> It's everything that was great about old sandbox Mario and everything that's been great about modern linear Mario brought together to make one incredible experience. I know there's plenty of disagreement between the sandboxers and the linearers, but golly goodness, I hope Mario sticks with this style at least for one or two more games. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much a given at this point. If there's gonna be one Switch game regularly at the top of my lists, is it gonna be the one I've made a three and a half hour review on, or one I've not made a three and a half hour review on? Breath of the Wild is already special in my book because of how it completely reworked the Zelda formula. Skyward Sword made a lot of changes to long-standing concepts, and I loved that. So getting a full refresh after so many years felt incredible. The combat is deeper than it's ever been by a really huge margin. Mechanics that were only touched on in other games are back and fully developed. But really, what makes Breath of the Wild special is that world. It's massive, it's beautiful, it's so ridiculously packed with secrets to find. It's kind of brutal, and a lot of its enemies are incredibly strong early on, so figuring out how to survive is an exciting new angle. And it's home to many, many enchanting surprises. My first time through, it provided an experience that I'd been waiting a long time for. Breath of the Wild is one of those games, you know? One of those incredible once-in-a-blue-moon adventures that connect with me at a deep-down soul kind of level. It's a game that reminded me all over again how magical games can be. It does have issues, and at the moment I do have to wonder if any of them will be addressed in the sequel. Will that game manage to connect with me deep down as well? I'm not sure. But in this moment, a half decade into the Switch's life, it's easy to say that Breath of the Wild is my number one. And now for another special treat, because you cleaned up all your dishes without me even asking, I'd like to end with one more list. I shall now add both of the previous lists together to create one ultimate top 10. These games are the best of the best, my absolute favorites on Switch. Here they are. Number 10, Blasphemous. Number nine, Monster Hunter Rise. Number eight, Bug Fables. Number seven, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Number six, Luigi's Mansion 3. Number five, Metroid Dread. Number four, Dark Souls. Number three, Super Mario Odyssey. 
Number two, Stardew Valley. And number one, surprising no one, it's The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yep, I enjoyed it just that much. It is still my absolute favorite game on the Switch thus far. We've still got some years though, and I have to wonder how this list will look when the Switch reaches the end of its life. Will new games come along and dethrone these older ones? Will I revisit some of them and find that my opinion has changed? I don't know, but I'll see you in a few years when we find out. And also a lot of times before that as well, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, I will be making at least a good few videos between now and then.